All right, welcome back to our live Q&A session right here on the Long Crime, Long Crime Trial Network as we take your questions about the Idaho murders investigation. I'm back with Long Crime's Ann Jeanette Levy, who is in Moscow, Idaho, outside of the police department. I'm also joined by former FBI special agent and attorney Bobby Chacon. Great questions. Keep them coming on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. We're going to keep the conversation going. Uh, Bobby, I'll go to you. Here's an interesting question from uh, Natalie Frazier on YouTube. Was the coroner interview premature? Wouldn't that have been bad for the investigation? Now, I believe what Natalie is referring to is the interview that uh, Lata County Coroner Kathy Mabut uh, gave with, I believe, NBC kind of early on in the investigation, talking about the extensive wounds, uh, the time frame of when everybody was killed. Is that standard to speak out that early? No, I don't think it is. And I, I, you know, like I said earlier, my tone as an investigator was always to keep everything in as long as and as much as I could, um, not give interviews. Uh, you know, this is a different world than when I was investigating the the, the drumbeat for information from this 24-hour news cycle um, and the internet um, wasn't present in the late 80s and early 90s when I was doing most of my investigations. But um, you generally want to keep as much information. Uh, to, to inside the investigation as you can. You share a little bit with the families, a little bit, um, and you release anything that might be of strategic importance to the investigation. In other words, you release it to the public hoping for tips. Or if you're watching a suspect, you can maybe watch them after you release the information and see if they behave in a different way. So I think that there's some strategic benefit. But in this case, um, no, I don't think it's advisable to, to put out that kind of information. You might share it with the families because there's, there's an emotional need to know, uh, um, but some of the wounds you don't want to share with the families. Um, and so I think that, you know, again, my, my default position is any information that goes out potentially could compromise the investigation. And unless it serves a strategic benefit to the investigation, it shouldn't be released. I think the police department might be feeling that right now. Uh, and Jeanette, want to go to you? At Posh Penguin 3, which is great for multiple reasons. One, I hope that there was Posh Penguin 1 and Posh Penguin 2, and this user had to go to Posh Penguin 3. And that's how we like our penguins, stylish, posh, perfect. So Posh Penguin 3 on Twitter says, was Ethan Chapin at the Betty Ball that night with his siblings? Was Zana with him? At what point did they make their way to the Sigma Chi fraternity? Well, we know that they were at the Sigma Chi fraternity at around 9 p.m. Uh, on November 12th, that Saturday night. Uh, where they were in between 9 p.m. and 1.45 a.m., uh, that's something we're trying to get the answers to. Uh, we talked yesterday, you know, I, I met up with and just kind of ran into the president of Sigma Chi outside as he was going to class. And he just, you know, didn't remark on their whereabouts for that night. He said everything they know they've shared with F the FBI, Moscow police, and the Idaho State Police, and that they've cooperated th with the investigation. But we know that Moscow police, as of Monday, didn't know uh, where they were between those hours because they're trying to put that timeline together. So I don't know if Ethan was at that event with his siblings or not. Ethan is a triplet, uh, and his other siblings, his two siblings, uh, surviving siblings attend the University of Idaho as well. So uh, I know police are looking into that. That's a question we have for them. And uh, we're going to try to get the answer to that question, too. I know. I know you're on it, Anjanette. And we have more questions actually directed specifically <laughs> towards you in one second. Uh, before we do, Bobby, I want to go to you. We have a question from uh, one of our Twitter followers, at TrialWatcher22. Could this have been a serial killer just passing through and is long gone, or is that unlikely? Oh, that's it's unlikely. Um, and I've spoken to some of my um, former colleagues that I work with now almost on a daily basis who are former FBI profilers. Um, uh, vict uh, serial killers usually have a, a signature. Um, they don't usually kill more than one person at a time, although it has happened. It's unusual. Um, and this is not the type of um, crime that we usually see, um, uh, the victimology of which, uh, you know, serial killers usually have a specific type of victim and a specific, some have a ritual they go through when they do the killings, and, and none of that is here. These are multiple victims, seemingly random. I think that 
probably, in my opinion, one one of these people was the targeted victim, and the other was collateral. The other three were collateral. Um, but it doesn't seem to me like a serial killer. Serial killers, because the way they get away with it for so long, are usually much more careful. And this killer didn't seem to be careful. I think you know, entering a house with six people in it is is not careful. Now they did mm. get away. I, I grant you that, but it's not generally a safe way to do it. Mm. Okay, so I have, a, like I said, Anjanette, we have questions directed specifically towards you. Sorry, Bobby, no offense. Mm -hmm. This is from Drew, Cro <laughs> Drew Cohen on YouTube. Please ask Anjanette about a camera at 1320 Linda Lane, Moscow, Idaho, right by the house, facing Taylor Avenue, the main road in that neighborhood that connects King Road to the main road. You know anything about that, Anjanette? I don't, but I feel like I'm going to have to go look into that later <laughs> yeah, today. Right? <laughs> I think I need you to text that address to me and all yeah. of that information. Uh, so, no, I don't. Uh, but we've been keeping an eye out for uh, video cameras. And also, you know, they've been putting out a call for surveillance footage. They've uh, asked people within certain a certain radius uh, to submit all of their surveillance footage. So uh, we know they've gotten a lot of video and digital evidence uploaded to that FBI website, but uh, I think we'll have to go look into that camera uh, that was mentioned by that, uh, that yeah. questioner, that viewer, uh, <laughs> here I, a little later today. I wonder if that's somebody who's actually from the area. Look, sometimes the pub right. investigators need the public's help. They know details. They know things right. that other people will not know. I go to you, Bobby, from Sultan Shake on YouTube. We talked about this earlier, but I was wondering whether the father hiring a private investigator, we talked about the lawyer, whether hiring a private investigator will impact the case. Now, what we know from Mr. Gonsalves is he wouldn't reveal the identity of who this person is, but it seems to be somebody who's former law enforcement, had much experience, had a very high clearance rate. Hiring a private investigator, how's that going to impact the case? Well, hopefully it doesn't impact the case, and hopefully that private investigator coordinates all of his efforts or her efforts with the, the investigative team. Um, the danger, of course, is that they go out and re-interview witnesses that have already been interviewed. And, you know, later on, if there's a grand jury and a person gives multiple statements and sometimes they seemingly might conflict with their prior statements, that can be used against them, particularly at trial. Um, so, you, you know, I was never in favor of a parallel investigation. Um, however, if they are doing it and they have the right to do it, I, I, I understand that, um, I would hope that they're coordinating all their efforts with the investigative team. Um, because that's important. Because if you're not coordinating, um, mistakes can be made, and and it could it could hurt the investigation. Angela, I'm going to throw two questions out to you. Uh, one is from Sierra Edwards on YouTube. Have they confirmed how the killer made entry into the home? And the second question is from Rachel Henderson from YouTube. Are the police 100% sure there was only one killer? So much carnage by just one killer. Bobby and I talked about the likelihood of multiple killers, but what has actually been confirmed in terms about the entry point and the number of assailants? You know, I, we don't have it a lot confirmed on an actual entry point. As I mentioned, there was a lot of attention being p p paid to that sliding glass door that leads to the second floor of the home. Uh, we are going to see if maybe that was the entry point. It seems most likely uh, based on just how the house is laid out and how it looks. Uh, I think it would take a lot to get up to the balcony on the third floor. So, and th this is a house, you know, from what we've seen on TikTok and stuff like that from some of the videos that it's, it's, it looks like it has, you know, one staircase that goes up to the second floor possibly. And then there's another smaller staircase set of stairs. So this is a split level house. There's three different levels. Uh, so we are going to look into that, the entry point at question, as well as other questions about whether or not they believe there's more than one person involved. It, it seems to me, and I agree with Bobby, you know, just based on what we know, that it likely probably is one person and one person only. Bobby, just to go off of another question that we keep seeing a lot is in terms of the target, right? We know the police went back and forth about where uh, the individuals in the house targeted were um, and why just those four individuals that were killed and not the other two people that were on the ground floor uh, or whether or not the house was targeted. Was there something about the house? Where do you stand on what we know so far on whether or not it was the house or the specific people who were targeted? 
Well, yeah. So, so in in homicide school, they taught us to you, a Venn diagram, which for those of you who don't know, is two circles that are overlapped with each other. One is the location of the homicide, and all the your suspect pool comes from all the people that might be associated with the location of the homicide, and then the victim is the second circle, and where they overlap, where those two circles, all the people that are in that victim's life, and so where those two overset intersect or overlap is where your likely suspect is going to come. So. I think that in this particular situation, I don't think it was the house. I think this was because of the, the brutality of the murders and because two of the people in the house were left as survivors. I yeah. think that the killer was going. They, they, and my understanding is there were only two rooms, two people right. in one room, two people in the other victims. Right. And so I think that they may have chosen the wrong room initially, oh, killed the people that were in there, and then moved on to the second room right. where they found their intended victim. Once they found that intended yeah. victim, so, then they departed the resident. So, Bobby, sorry to cut you off. Thank you so much for your analysis and breakdown on this. And Jeanette, thank you so much for reporting on the ground. Stay safe. And everyone out there, thank you so much for your questions. We'll be right back.